Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. remind you whatever you're going through that's exactly the case you have found a friend a spiritual friend on your journey it's so easy to be distracted by this life not just this world but the life that we have to live here and our soul is crying out for eternal life our soul is reaching for that place and we have a friend there pulls us through the darkness the spiritual oppression and establishes us there that's the goodness of our God amen that's the goodness of our God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated this morning. The Lord is so good. So very good. Hallelujah. My heart found a surgeon. Praise God. And a good one. Amen. There are surgeons and then there is the best. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Well, I've got to get uh, rescheduled now because my life is only really oriented around Sundays. And when we change times and from two services to one, I have to, I have to recalibrate everything. And I'm not, last week I didn't do very good at that. But I'll try to have you out here before one today. Go in your Bibles in the Old Testament to the book of Numbers. You know that's not true. I, we, we borrowed a little extra time from you last week, but it was Easter. Amen. There was so much I wanted to do with that message, and I just, I really, I, I looked up and something, I forget what happened, but I just felt stressed and I didn't get there. But, you know, the concept of Pilate coming into town at the same time that Jesus was coming in is revolutionary. And to understand that, that his kingdom represents strategy, organization, but also manipulation, control, dominion. So everybody behind him is just regimented, but where his, that, that people get caught up in that. Well, I want to be a part of something that's really, you know, organized, strategic, but where's it going? And his kingdom led to death. On the other side, you had Jesus, and it specifically, the Bible specifically says he was in the center, not at the head, but in the center of everything. And I made mention that how when we're around him, we can bump into each other, we can offend each other, we step on each other's toes. Thousands, millions, I don't know how many people have gotten hurt through church. People who love God got hurt because of church. I and mean, that's just because we don't have all that strategic organization around Jesus. We're just running around happy that he saved us. And we can run into each other. And that's why we have to be very patient, and forgiving. But his parade is the only one that offers life eternal life. I want to take a look at a little bit of a different concept today here in Numbers chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. You should have read this. If you're reading with us, and what a great journey this has been. Uh, we were talking the other day about why it's so much, I don't know, more exciting to read the Old Testament. I think it's partly because many of us are doing it together, and we know that. And so we're encouraged. I've had lots of people tell me they're reading ahead. You're way up... Kings or wherever. And there's just an energy about this. And I think also because we know we're in the end times, that we are excited about revelations that we're seeing in the Old Testament. Amen? You should have read this, but it struck me in a powerful way. Numbers 31, look at verse 21. Then Eliezer the priest said to the men who were in the battle, he said to the men who were in the battle, the Lord has given Moses this legal requirement. Now this is new. We haven't seen this before. You know who Eliezer is. He's Aaron's son. Aaron is the high priest, the first high priest. And his son, Eliezer, is functioning as, I guess you would say, the priest now. 
and he is with the troops in battle. And when we come back, Moses is still alive. Moses has not died. But on behalf of what Moses has told them, Eliezer steps out and speaks. And so we need to pay attention to this because this is a new kind of a format with him speaking. The Lord has given Moses this legal requirement, anything made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, tin, or lead, that is, all metals that do not burn, must be passed through the fire in order to be made ceremonially, ceremonially pure. These metal objects must then be further purified with the water of purification. But everything that burns must be purif purified by the water alone. On the seventh day, you must wash your clothes and be purified. Then you may return to camp. We talk a lot about spiritual warfare for brothers and sisters, don't we? For us as followers of Jesus. We go through spiritual warfare. We battle things. Not just the demonic, often in churches like ours, and we say that we immediately think about the demonic, but spiritual warfare with our flesh, spiritual warfare with our emotions and our struggles with forgiveness and offering forgiveness or finding it within us, uh, eliminating resentment. All of those things are part of spiritual warfare. So the children of Israel go to battle. Now this is a little bit of a new wrinkle as well. Because as they came out of Egypt, they were mostly in a defensive posture. They'd been delivered from a military oppression regime. And so they come out without even very much in the way of weapons. But as they're heading towards the promised land and they get, you know, kind of delayed through their own disobedience, God has to deal with several of the surrounding countries that have not responded to his influence as to how they should treat Israel. And so he sends the Israelites out to do battle with the Midianites. And when they come back, Eliezer, the priest, steps into the place of Moses. Moses has the place, I guess you would say, the prophet or the king, in a sense, the deliverer. But now we have the priest step up. And he says, listen, you know that I'm speaking on behalf of Moses. And here's the deal. When you enter into battle, there are things that happen that make you unclean. We need to remember that. When we've gone through something, when we've come through a, a situation, Pastor, this doesn't apply to me. When we've gone through a situation with our extended family and there was contention. When we've gone through a situation at work or at school and there was conflict and we're agitated, we're uncomfortable emotionally, we're struggling, we can't sleep, we can't eat, we can't breathe right, all of that because of the stress of how wronged we feel we were. Now, I can't see you unless I do this, so i got to get a look here at your faces so I know how this is happening, how it's going with you. I can sense what's going in and what's not, and it looks like it's going in. We've been there, right? We, this is life. We live this. What we fail to understand is coming out of that, those feelings, those descriptors that I just used represent a hindrance between us and the Lord. Now, I told you a few moments ago that it's important to remember, I'm using the vaccine or the pandemic, the virus, as an illustration, but it's important for us to remember how slippery and seductive the enemy is and our flesh. And I'm watching around the world as many believers are being seduced by the enemy to feel that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is not enough for them to make it to heaven, that they have to add something to it. And I tell you, you need to be very, very careful. Tuesday morning, the Lord nudged me about fire. And I believe that what I was made to understand is that we are in a time of fire. We're being tested by fire. Now, when I say we, it might just be me. And so you're going to go on a journey with me to understand what it means. We're going to go through the scriptures and see. But I believe it's more than me. And I think it's this church, but it might even be more than the church. It might be nationally, it might be globally. Going through a time of fire and testing... Because the Lord wants to find out who really understands the love of Jesus and who thinks the love of Jesus is conditional and subjected or necessary for them to add to it. 
Here's what happens. I love Jesus. I do. But I also know that I'm not very good. I struggle. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. So, you know, I, I'm kind of concerned about this whole uh, vaccine thing. And, you know, if I take that vaccine and it represents the mark of the beast, then I'm not. So I'm going to show God that if I don't take that vaccine, I really do mean I love Jesus. So what you've just done is added to the work of the cross. You think that your action helped make the cross more effective. Now, I'm using that. I don't care about the vaccine. I don't care if you take it or not. I don't care about the pandemic. There are 10 million other things that will do the exact same thing. In the kingdom of God, we're always being pulled and we're always being pushed. And if we get to the point where we feel like, oh, it's grace, 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 that can do the same thing. If we get to the point where we think, the cross needs more of my help. It does the same thing. Do you understand that your flesh is constantly working to try to separate you from Jesus Christ? Your flesh is altogether corrupted, and it cannot be made incorruptible. It cannot be. So it's always opposing you. Always. And whenever you say, well, you know, it's, it's not the grace, this easy grace that was a big thing over these last five years in the kingdom world, it's not that. But it's also not you adding anything to it. Now, that's a fine line. It's a challenge. But here's how you stay where you need to be. Wake up and love Jesus. Go through your day loving Jesus. And go to bed at night loving Jesus. And that's it. There's nothing else you can do. Well, I just want to make sure that I'm doing enough. That, my friend, is everything. It takes all of your commitment, all of your surrender. Jesus, when they said that to him, what works? You tell us to do the works of God. What works should we do? Believe on him whom the Father has sent. It's 24-7. Sometimes it means understanding his grace and just being silly about the goodness of his grace. Sometimes it means understanding the requirements and doing something that Jesus has asked you to do, or giving up something that he's asked you to let go of. Yeah, it's all of that. We're going to go through a fire, and you need to be ready for the fire. I'm not sure what, what your ringtone was there, but um, it sounds like somebody's trying to get a hold of you. In the fire, things happen. And in going through the fire, the Lord's intent is very clear. Go to Psalm 66. I want you and I to thrive through the fire. Amen? I want to thrive through the fire. Psalm 66, and look at verse 8. Are you there? Psalm 66, verse 8. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. Now, for those churches that say you have to be quiet, for those churches that don't want anything above a whisper, what do you do with this? It, this is what it says in my Bible. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. Our lives are in his hands and he keeps our feet from stumbling. You have tested us, O God. You have purified us like silver. You captured us in your net and laid the burden of slavery on our backs. Then you put a leader over us. We went through fire and flood, but you brought us to a place of great abundance. Hallelujah. Now let's uh, look at 13 to 15. Now I come to your temple with burnt offerings to fulfill the vows I made to you. Yes, the sacred vows that I made when I was in deep trouble. That's why I'm sacrificing burnt offerings to you, the best of my rams as a pleasing aroma, and a sacrifice of bulls and male goats. Number one today, thriving through the fire. Number one, the burden of slavery brings us to the fire. Now, obviously, this is a reference to their time in Egypt. This is a reference to what they've gone through. But for you and I as believers, New Testament, spirit-filled believers, this is an understanding, a help to us to understand what takes place in God's working in us. Our lives are not fire-free. As a matter of fact, we go through the fire. This is what he wants. Peter says it's our faith in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. It's our faith being tested, right? You've read that. And we're being tested as fire purifies gold. But I'm going to tell you something. As a believer, you and your faith are one. You're inseparable. 
Your faith isn't over here and you're here. It's the same. You love Jesus with your whole being. He said to love the Lord God with all your strength, all your soul, all your might, all your heart, all everything. Right? You and your faith are almost synonymous. You can't be separated. It's the same thing. So for your faith to go through fire means you're going to go through fire. When my faith is being tested. It's me going through fire. I shared a situation with you earlier before the service started, if you were in here, just my extended family, and, and just going through it. Not, not with, I'm not talking about sickness, but I'm talking about how we interact with all of the related situations, how we respond emotionally, what causes us fear. What if I'm alone? What if I don't have any food? What if I run out of money? What if... See, we have all these fears that bear down on us, and that's part of what God allows as a refining fire, so that as we're going through that, we're being tested, and it's our faith, our faith. You can change and use the word confidence or trust. I love Jesus. I know he will take care of me. But too many believers say this, I love Jesus, but I'm not sure he'll be there for me. So I need to do this or that. I need to make sure of this or that. Now again, listen, you can be sitting on the same pew with another believer, and one, Jesus says to one, do this. He says to the other one, don't do that. I'm not talking about things that are clearly spelled out in the book. I'm not talking about things that are clearly defined as sin. I'm talking about certain investments. The Lord might say to this one, I want you to do that, do this, do the other. And you're sitting over there saying, I don't understand why they're getting so prospered. I need to do this, that, and the other. No, you've got to talk to Jesus. Oh, well, I don't have time. I'm busy. I can't find a, a place. There's no, no place in my house. Even my attic is full of junk. I can't get up there and pray. There's nowhere to pray. All my junk's fall. Did you see that lady they found last month up in New York City? She was some person involved in movies or Hollywood or something. They found her. She had been missing for months. They found her. Everything, all of her junk in the kitchen fell on top of her. And they found her there just like that. Some family member finally got upset that they hadn't heard from her. Listen. If you don't see me for two consecutive Sundays and you haven't heard from me, something's probably wrong. All right? Just go ahead. Don't wait six months. Just go ahead and say, something's wrong with Pastor. Let's go, let's go find out. But they found her under all of her junk. Gang, you got a problem. If you can't find a corner to pray in in your house because of all the junk. We're a nation of junk, aren't we? Oh, I'm going to clean that out. I'm getting ready to just clean that out. I'm going to go through all of it. Just, and we've got websites that, that allow you to sell your stuff. You've got eBay and you've got Facebook. And we, and we make it easier than ever. And they come right to your door and pick it up. And you can put it in a box and send it to whoever bought your junk because they need more junk at their house. We got, the easier it gets, the more junk we got. And then they put it on a boat from all these other countries and send it over here because we don't have enough junk yet. And everybody's happy until the big boat gets stuck in the Panama Canal. Was it while I was in Pakistan or was it over here? That, I, my, was it my sister trying to figure out why they, why, why they all got stuck in the Panama Canal? It was the Suez Canal gang, okay? And uh, the big boat got stuck, and they said, oh, nobody can get any of their stuff because all the other boats are stocked up. And here we are in America worried about more junk. When Jesus is in our life, he takes us through fire. This should not be surprising to us. This is warfare. It's an everyday battle. For those of you watching, I'm not talking about some armed warfare, armed insurrection. I'm not talking about that. It has nothing to do with that. The weapons of our warfare are not of this world. You can't make them, manufacture them. You can do tax incentives in your state of West Virginia and beg all the gun manufacturers to move there. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual warfare. And it's not just Satan and his kingdom. It's warfare against my corrupt soul. And it can't be made incorruptible. It can only be crucified. It can only die. I have to pick up my cross every day and follow Jesus. Right? Every day. And the further we get away from that, the more difficult it's going to be. 
The testings and trials are to purify us. That's what the goal of them is, or the goals are for every trial. The burden of slavery. See, you didn't, you didn't leave your old life to become free. You left your old life to change masters. Now, I recognize in the world's context, there's a lot of uh, issue in America about that term, master. And I understand the historic nature of slavery here in the U.S., but we're using it in our... It's never, that term is never going to leave the church because we serve a master. We are his slaves. Now, he doesn't beat us. He doesn't mistreat us. He doesn't hang us from a tree. Glory to God. He took care of that by going to the tree. But he does own us. Now his ownership requires a voluntary cooperation from us. And the problem is that even though we got saved, there's still a part of us that doesn't want to voluntarily cooperate. (laughs) And so there's conflict. You could describe it as war. And whenever you surrender to Jesus Christ, there's going to be a part of you that is not happy. It's going to be that way. Oh, I don't understand what you're talking about, Pastor. Why don't you fast this week? Do a a 24, 36-hour fast or a three-day fast. You'll find that part of you that does not want to cooperate. I can't see it. You can't see it in me. But when you say, I'm going to fast or I'm going to read my Bible for an hour, you will find that part. That part will say, oh, that's great. That's a good idea. Come on, let's do it. In three and a half minutes or less into your journey of fasting or reading your Bible for an hour, your flesh will never say, I'm the flesh. I am not putting up with it. This is what your flesh will say. You know that that room needs painted. What are you doing sitting? Come on. Listen, you've got lots of time to read your Bible. Tonight before you go to bed, that's the best time to read. Read when you're quiet and calm. Read. Read when everything around you is still. And then it'll be tonight, and you'll say, Oh, I didn't read my Bible today. I'm going to read it now. And then you wake, catch yourself, and you wake up. Oh, I was going to read my Bible. And then, then that part of you will say, You know, tomorrow morning is a better time to read your Bible. You're so tired right now. And after all, I, I, you have to take care of you. you. If you don't love you, you can't love other people. You have to be self-care oriented. You've got to love you. How many of you have been reading that a lot in the last couple of years? It's all about self-care. It's all about loving you. You've got to love you to be able to love other people. No, you don't. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. But lots and lots of believers have bought into that now. I have to love me so that I can love other people. No, you don't. You have to love Jesus. Huh? Come on. Yeah. Oh, listen. I'm not against taking care of yourself. Nothing wrong with that. But you put yourself in the driver's seat and you're going to have a car wreck. Maybe not today. Maybe not even this year. But it will happen. Not for everybody, but for believers. Because believers cannot have self in the driver's seat. It is a collision that will happen sooner rather than later. Here's the second thing. Go with me now to... Isaiah 43. You know this one. This is a famous text. Isaiah 43. And look at verse 1. We are slaves. He is our master. And he will not compliment the flesh. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says... Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Notice again the speaking the context of slavery and those who took the place of the Israelites and what God did to purchase their freedom or to bring them into slavery to himself. Now look at verse 10. 
But you are my witness, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. I know this is Old Testament, but gang, that is the core of the gospel in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and forever. You have been chosen to know the Lord. You have been chosen to believe in Him, and you have been chosen to understand that He alone is God. It's not just that Buddha's not God, or Muhammad's not God, or Allah's not God. It is that you are not God also, and I am not God. I cannot save myself. There's no God good that dwells in me. I have been chosen to know him and to understand that he alone is God. He has redeemed me. He has brought me through every trial and he'll never let go of me. I can trust in him in every conflict. I can trust him. I cannot trust my flesh. I can trust him. But you have to spend some time with him to know that. And even when you know it in the middle of the trial, it is tenuous. God, are you really there? John the Baptist saw the sword coming closer and said to his disciples, go quickly to him and say, can I trust you or do I look for another? Jesus could have said yes or no, but instead he sent back this reply, tell John, everything you hear is true. The blind are healed. The deaf are healed. The lame are healed. The multitudes are fed. The dead are raised back to life. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. It doesn't say it, but I can imagine those two disciples of John saying, that's all we need, come on, let's go. Running as fast as they can run to get to John before the sword falls. John, it's him. We can trust him. At some point in the next few hours or days, John says, this is what I've been prepared for. Send a message to the king. Tell him I have a, a word for him. Here comes the king who wants to set John free. The king who, who wants to, to do the best for John. He, he likes hearing John. John says, powerful preacher. The Spirit of God moves. Things happen. The nation is shaken when John preaches. But here comes the king, and from his cell, the prophet says, I'm telling you right now, you took her against God's law and against God's will. You've kept her, and you, my friend, are under the judgment of God. So later when the king has his banquet and his stepdaughter dances so provocatively and he says, you tell me what you want and I'll give it up to half of my kingdom. He's not being literal. But she knows there's a lot of things her mom wants. But nothing more than John's head. And so when she says to the king, I want the head of John the Baptist on a plate right now, the king says, it's fine. I can blame it on you. John had this confidence. I can trust him. What did Job say? Though he slay me. Though he slay me. Though he slay me. Not the devil. Not unbelievers. Though he slay me. I'm going to trust him. And so what we see here, I think, is so profound. I know it's Israel in the Old Testament, but you and I can say that it's the church, the Old Testament church, the New Testament church. Number one, the burden of slavery brings us to the fire. Number two, the oppression we face brings us through the fire. That's what he says in verse 2. When you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you'll not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you'll not be burned up. Now, the New Living and one or two of the other contemporary translations adds that phrase, the fire of oppression. The King James, New King James do not, but that's the intent here. That's really what he's conveying. It, it's not literally there, but that's the implication. The fire of oppression. And you and I can get very frustrated and we can get all worked up when here in America people don't understand and they're coming against faith and they're really attacking uh, the, the biblical faith or attacking the foundations of our faith. I get it. I understand. It's horrible. It's a mess. It's, it's a nightmare. Yes, I got it. But do you want to change the nation? 
don't get divorced. Now listen, for those of you who have already been through a divorce, I am not condemning you, judging you. I understand. I got it. And it happens. Sometimes it happens, and there's probably absolutely nothing you or anybody else can do. I get it. And there's no scarlet letter on you of D in the church. Your divorce, you can't be used. But let me tell you something. We sit in the church, and we criticize the world. And we say, oh, you know, oh, they should have stopped abortion when they saw that we were now encouraging women in the last trimester to get an abortion. And then we, we found out we're selling baby parts. And, but, oh, we didn't stop that. We went even, and then we went to same-gender marriage. And we should have stopped that. And people in the world should have seen that there was no end in that, no help, no wholeness. And, and well, then they didn't stop there. They went on to now everybody's the wrong gender. These boys need to be girls, and those girls need to be boys. And, and we... We just constantly say that the world's oppressing us. But why are all those people so hurt? What started in them? You want to change the world? Change it right there in your home. But pastor, I, uh, these, these things are big and we need politics and we need laws. And Listen, you're not going to change anybody's heart by law. You can try, look at the racial issues that... That all that it's doing is getting more and more intense and more and more, and laws are passed, and we try to shame people. I'm not talking about us in the church, but culturally, there's this shame, and, and this is, and, and there's this moment of reckoning for this group or that group, and you're not, it's a sin issue. And the further in America we get away from the church, there's a reason that all of this keeps just percolating up, because we've said the church is not necessary in our nation then you get all this other stuff. Because there's no force. You can have every citizen become a congressman or wo man or woman. Wouldn't that be great? We'd all be congressmen and women. And we'd all vote ourselves raises and great pensions and everything would just be great. We'll just borrow another $83 trillion and we'll all be congressmen and women. You can do that. You can have all the laws you want. What you're going to find out is people are still racist. Because it can't be changed by any power here on earth. Because the flesh always wants to be seen as better, and you can't do it in the flesh by saying, I'm better than God. So you have to be able to say, I'm better than somebody else. So Isaiah comes along and says, listen, <clears throat> here's what you need to know. When you go through the fire of oppression, you'll not be burned up. You don't need laws to protect you. You know, I understand the necessary part of having a godly nation. I get it. But what I'm telling you is that Jesus is your protection. That Jesus will take care. But pastor, what if, what if something happens and I'm, I'm put on trial? It's the same tomorrow when you wake up. Jesus is still there to take care of you. It's Jesus. It's not Jesus and you doing this, that, or the other. If he tells you to do something, yes, do it. But if he doesn't tell you, but he told the person beside you, rejoice that they're obeying Jesus. You understand, I'm not talking about things that are clearly defined as sin right now. What I'm saying is, follow Jesus. What he tells you to do, do it, and he'll take care of you. He's enough. You don't have to add to him. i got to hurry up. We have been chosen to know the Lord. Look at verse 10. You are my witnesses, O Israel, or people of God. You are my servant. You've been chosen. You have been chosen. Isn't that the song we just sang? Was that, is that what you were singing? I've been chosen, not forsaken. Listen, you can sing it forever. You can sing it till the cows come home. I don't know what that means. I don't know where they're coming from. But I'm going to tell you something. That it's easy to come in here on Sunday and sing, I'm chosen. It's hard to go out of here and in the middle of the oppression when the fire is hot and purifying you the most to say, Hallelujah, I'm chosen. This doesn't look very good, but I'm chosen. But that's what it means to be a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. That no matter how intense, you simply bow your head and say, I'm a slave to the King of glory. He will take care of me. But I don't want to die. I understand. Nobody does. But when the time comes that the oppression is the most pronounced against you, Jesus will be the most evident in you.
That's the testimony of the church. It's always been that way and it always will be. It is Stephen standing and saying, I see the king of glory. All right, come on, let's get out of here. You are not forsaken. You cannot be snatched out of his hand. Oh, I love that. Did I read all of that to you, all through 13? 11, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. First, I predicted your rescue. Then I saved you and proclaimed it to the world. No foreign God has ever done this. No flesh, no self. Self cannot do that. Self cannot predict your rescue and then rescue you. No foreign God has ever done this. You are witnesses that I am the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I've done. Why did I say anything about divorce? Because, and especially if you have kids, it just, it's difficult. And all of us, every believer who goes through it, and again, there is no capital letter D, on you, and if you've been through it, I love you, God loves you, and I know that believers don't never want that. But listen, it leaves residue. It leaves scars. And the generation that comes out of that brings forth a generation. And that's where we are now. And they're so unstable, so confused, so fearful and addicted, I don't know what we're going to do as a country because there seems to be no evidence that anybody can step forth and start speaking the truth. Not their truth, the truth. That there is no hope outside of a national revival. There is none. Here's the third and final thing. Go to, go to uh, Zechariah. Zechariah. And look at verse, or chapter 13. Kind of a a larger book right before the end of the Old Testament, right before Malachi, Zechariah 13, and look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Who just took credit for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? No, God his Father. Satan, through Satan, using Satan, absolutely. Absolutely using the enemy. But God is always in control. But pastor, that's what I, I, don't, I, don't, want, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be the sacrifice. I, I just want to live my life, enjoy my retirement, and die in my sleep and go and be with Jesus. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and you want to have a white picket fence on your journey in the right car and watch the great TV shows and listen to all the right kind of great music. Can I tell you that's what heaven is? But flesh wants heaven now, but this is not heaven. Amen? Yeah, so God takes credit, or you could say blame. Strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn against the lambs. Two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord, but one-third will be left in the land. I will bring that group through the fire. Glory to God. I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Number one, the burden of slavery brings us to the fire. Our slavery to Jesus Christ puts us in the position of going through fires. Number two, the oppression we face brings us through the fire. That's what Isaiah said. That oppression of struggle and battle and trying to surrender the Lord, that's, that's what he's using to bring us through. When we finally come to this, this conflict and that battle and we can't go backwards, we can't go, and we just cry out, Jesus, it's in that, in that moment. The oppression has brought us to that, that we have no other, no other recourse but to cry out to Jesus. And when we do, he says, I got you. The oppression we face brings us through the fire So how do we survive? Oh, look at verse 9. They will call on my name. We sang that this morning as well. They will call on my name. Number three, we survive the fire by calling on his name. Listen, I can't 
say it any other way than just straight out. That's our answer. That's how we make it. We have not been called by God to change politics, to change culture, to change the nation. When we call on the name of Jesus, if enough of us call on the name of Jesus in the fire, the nation will change. Politics will submit. Everything will come in alignment. But we've got to do first things first. We can't say to the nation, we can't say to the culture, straighten up, clean up, get straight. We've got to say within ourselves, I've got to straighten up. I've got to call on the name of Jesus in the fire, in the truth trial when I'm oppressed I've got to call on Jesus and when I call on his name he's promised to hear me to be there to remind me that I am not forsaken nothing can snatch me out of his hand nothing can take me away from him he loves me with an everlasting love he will take care of me you've got to know that you've got to believe it that no matter what you're going through some financial purification some financial oppression how would you like to be the guy that lost 20 billion dollars last week have you seen that headline? His father was a pastor. He's a believer. Strong giver in the kingdom. Gave millions and millions. He has an unbelievable gift for attracting wealth. Unbelievable. He's of Asian descent. I forget which country his parents are from, but um, grew up here in America and uh, has just had a career of money, investments, and, and uh, just creating wealth. Well, he had, a, you can read the, the headline, I don't remember his name, but uh, he had <laughs> a sense that things were going to go a certain way financially, and he had several banks that were backing him to the tune of several billion dollars each, and in two days, $20 billion of value was gone. It's, it is sending shockwaves through the financial markets around the world. Uh, Credit Suisse, I think it was, one, one or two of their top guys were fired because of it. $20 billion in two days. It's like a record. That's how much, and I got no doubt, in two or three years, he'll be, I'm glad that wasn't my week. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I think if I bought something the next week it went on sale, I think, oh, my Lord in heaven, help me. What have I done here? I've, I've just fallen apart. I've messed everything up. Bid on eBay and somebody outbids me. Oh, God, help me in heaven. What do I do to deserve this? $20 billion in two days. Listen, no matter what you go through, you and I have to know that as we go through it, Jesus will be there to help us. That's the key of the gospel. That is the gospel. That no matter what you go through, your faith and trust in him is unshakable. It's not somebody else. It's not the name of, of angels, not the name of religions. It is Jesus Christ, the King of glory, the Son of the living God. He loves me with an everlasting love. He died for me. I hold to him. He'll hold to me. We will make it through. The Holy Spirit says in 1 Corinthians 3 that all our works will pass through the fire when we stand before him. All of our works. The only way that your works, when they pass through the fire, will be found to have been gold, silver, or other metals that we talked about, read about in Numbers. The only way is that if you are clinging to Jesus Christ in everything you go through, in every oppression, every trial, every obstacle, every question, every legal matter, every financial matter, every health matter, you've got to cling to Jesus. But pastor, I've been praying for 17 years and still not you got a lot of gold in heaven waiting. But that's not very encouraging. That's not what I signed up for. I want an answer. I want, it, I want a miracle. It'll come. But you've been saying that the whole time I've known you, and it still hasn't come. I don't know if I can trust Jesus or you. <laughs> Here's the good news. We're in it together. <laughs> Here's better news. He's in the boat with us. Bow your heads with me today. Father, thank you so much that in every fiery trial, Jesus Christ is the key. He's the king. He's the answer. He's the miracle and the solution. But if he chooses not to do something in our timing in a certain situation or predicament, he's still trustworthy. He's still God. He's still got our backs. He's still in control. He's still bringing us home to himself. He's still going to make a way where there seems to be no way. He still is the God that overflows us with blessing and meets every need we have. He's the God of grace and comfort. He's the God of mercy. 
and he's the God of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He has everything we need, and he'll never fail us. Praise God. Now let me ask you something. Do you feel like you're going through a fire? Do you feel like somebody here this morning, I'm, I'm feeling something about your past divorce. You, I don't know why the Lord's checking me on this, but you're, you may already be remarried, but there's something back there that still keeps testing you and, and really oppressing you. And I feel like the Lord is nudging me to just say to you, it's okay, let it go. Just, just let, trust Him. Just leave it and trust Him. Give it to Jesus, even if you have to give it to Him every day. But pastor, the kids, or pastor, the the retirement, listen, just give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Now, he may speak to you about something, but give it to him. Somebody else, several of you are still dealing with a lot of anxiety. The, The thing of the pandemic is not it, but results of that. You're questioning some things in your life now. You're questioning your own mental stability. You're questioning whether you're really prepared if something were to happen. Do you have your finances prepared? Do you have this? And I want to remind you, I just feel the Holy Spirit nudging. I just want to remind you, begin your preparations with Jesus. Jesus, what do you want me to do? Jesus, how do I learn to be calm through you? How do I learn to be calm through you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you today for helping us. Thank you. How many of you, just right there where you are, would say, Pastor, you're believers. You're strong, mature believers, but you would say, I'm really going through the fire right now, Pastor. Just slip your hand up real quick. Take it right back down. I'm in the fire. Yeah, I thought so. Lots of us feel like, wow, we're in the fire. Come on, stand with me this morning all over the house. If you can, stand with me. You know, the greatest example of being in the fire, of course, Daniel's friends. Those three young men said to the king, he will deliver us. But even if he doesn't. Don't you hate that? Why not just the first phrase? He will deliver us. (laughs) I'm just preaching their message. But even if he doesn't, he can be trusted. Every day that pulls at me. Every situation is a struggle for me to know that and to cling to it with everything in my grip. That's the gospel. Jesus is enough. And we have prayer teams here ready to pray for you today. Whatever fire you're in, it might be a a physical. You, You might be going through diagnosis, treatment, whatever it might be, waiting on surgery, and you're just anxious. I I understand that. You might be in a financial situation where you're not sure about tomorrow or next year, but you've got decisions to make. Maybe you're looking for a new job. Pandemic has forced you into a new career. Whatever. But in that fire, you know what's cool? We have each other. We have each other. I don't know which of the three said it. We're going in. He'll deliver us, and even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. I think the other two were standing right behind him saying, what he said, because, you know, when you got somebody else there with you that's going to say, I'm taking the fire, and again, then you say, oh, yeah, we're taking, hallelujah, we're taking the fire. But if you're there by yourself, today we're with you. I'm going through a situation with my family. We're in the fire. But God's able. If you want prayer this morning, the altar team's here, or there's a place on each side, this beautiful, beautiful altar. And you can slip in and pray there, and I'll come around and pray with you as well. But I just want you to feel encouraged today. I want you to feel supported in the fire. The fire's doing good things as we go through it. The fire's purifying us and getting us ready to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. As I pray, if you want to step out, step out and let somebody pray with you today. Father, thank you for our faith. When we go through the fire, our faith is strengthened, purified. Our resolve grows. In the fire, we recognize that our God is with us and nothing will take us out of His hand. In the fire, we find out you're faithful. We want to know that you're faithful before, but it's in the fire that we discover how good our God is, how able to protect us He is. Lord Jesus, remind us today 
that you will be with us in the fire. You will. You will, you will, you will. And we thank you for that today. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name. Maybe even right there where you are, you grab hands with somebody near you, a spouse or family member, even just a brother or sister in Christ, and say, you know what? I want to believe with you that as we go through fire, we're going to see Jesus in a new way. The rest of you, Brother Ricky, is going to lead us in some worship, and we're going to build faith for God to do miracles here at the altar today. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord.